Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, tonight's a really special night. The Salant Lecture is one of the great lectures we have every year, so it's always special, but it's doubly special tonight because of our special guest, who, uh, if there's enough, not enough specials in that intro so far, uh, let me know, uh, who, uh, as, as all of you know, is, is uh, a remarkable uh, woman. She has had many different uh, elements and strains in all the life and the career she's done, most of which is going to be explained by Alex. I would just say a couple of things. The first is here's someone who's been an extraordinary foreign policy expert who has uh, been served in government at very high levels, has uh, gone on to think about the role of technology both in foreign policy and in the media and press and so forth. Um, and somewhere along the way she wrote some article that I've heard something about and, um, and of course, she's also been dean of the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, another uh, school of public policy that, uh, in uh, New Jersey, I think. Um, and it, it uh, does raise the obvious question why Princeton gets all the really good deans. Um, but nonetheless, it's my great honor to, to welcome Anne Marie Slaughter here. It's, uh, I, we we, we uh, conspire in various ways and have over the years. Uh, my job now is just to, uh, in, to introduce Alex Jones. Uh, Alex is the uh, head of the Chornstein Center, which of course does uh, itself uh, remarkable work on a whole variety of issues having to do with, with press, politics, and public policy. Um, he himself has been awarded the Pulitzer Prize of, uh, in 1987. He covered uh, the press for the New York Times between 83 and 92. He's written many, many books, the most recent being Losing the News, The Future of News Feeds and Democracy. But the one thing I would like to emphasize, besides the fact that he's a, a remarkably thoughtful and terrific leader, is that he has been one of the real leaders in the Shorenstein Center and around the country in trying to think about not just what's going wrong or how frustrating it is that newspapers are seemingly dying, but what does the future hold in this for the fourth estate? How do we think about a democracy and how do we make democracy work in a world where we don't have the same kind of accountability and coverage uh, that we used to, and, and maybe we have it in a different form and so forth. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me give you Alex Jones and welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you, and uh, welcome again from me. Um, this is a night when we honor press freedom and look at the challenges it faces in these tumultuous times. Those challenges can come in many forms. In just a moment, you will hear from Anne-Marie Slaughter, uh, the Bert G. Kerstetter University Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton, one of the nation's most interesting thinkers, as well as one of the most outspoken ones. But before I speak about Anne-Marie, I want first to spend a moment on the two men who make tonight's lecture possible and whose contributions to a free press were enormous. This is the fifth annual Richard Salant Lecture on Freedom of the Press. Richard Salant was considered the greatest ever head of ne a network news division for his tenure at CBS during the time when CBS was truly the television news leader in the 1960s and 70s. When Richard Salant became president of CBS, president, president of CBS News, I should say, the Keystone Nightly News program was 15 minutes long. There was no 60 minutes, no full-time unit assigned to covering elections, no CBS morning news. He changed all that and made CBS the leader in raising television news to something respected journalistically in a way it never had been before. He stood for high quality news and a willingness to fight for that high quality. But I think it is important that I also mention another great CBS icon. I speak, of course, of Frank Stanton. He was a great friend of the Shorenstein Center in the, of the Kennedy School, and it is from a bequest in his will that the Salant Lecture was born. Frank Stanton was not a newsman in the literal sense. To the best of my knowledge, he never covered a story. But as president of the CBS network, he was a champion of news and press freedom. For one thing, he was Dick Salant's ally and champion. 
He made it possible for Dick Salant to win the reputation of being the world's greatest news division chief and made it possible for CBS to become respected as the nation's Tiffany network for news. The point is that this lecture could have been called the Frank N. Stanton lecture on freedom of the press. That it is named for his friend Richard Salant was the decision of Dr. Stanton, who among other things was remarkably modest. Anne-Marie Slaughter, though not a journalist, would have been a woman that Dick Salant and Frank Stanton would have admired, and more important, would have listened to. They were both ferocious advocates of what was, in their time, the new thing, television news. But they also worried about news and technology, about where it was going, and what the consequences, some un unintended and largely unforeseen, would be of the innovations in news that were happening with what seemed then like breakneck speed. The difference between the worries of Dick Salant and Frank Stanton and Amory Slaughter is that the CBS guys were focused on broadcasting. Amory's focus is something very different. Indeed, Amory is almost sui generis. She is a warm, lovely woman who has said that being a mother for me is the most important thing in my life. As David said, she famously underscored those words by resigning as the first we director of policy planning at the U.S. State Department and writing a cover story for The Atlantic with a headline, Why Women Still Can't Have It All. Her reason for resigning was that she had concluded that it wasn't possible for her to be both the mother her teenage sons needed and a senior policy, in a senior poli policy position in the United States government. It was by far the most read article ever published in the Atlantic, and in the months since the article appeared last summer, she's become an iconic voice in the area of juggling career and motherhood, and if a choice must be made, coming down in favor of motherhood. I should add that she strongly argues that it is a false choice that should not have to be made. But within the boundaries for herself that she has established, she was and remains a dynamo. Reviewing her history can create a bit of vertigo, like standing too close to the tracks when an acela is roaring by. She has a Belgian mother and American father, grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia, and graduated magna cum laude from Princeton. She also has master's and PhD degrees from Oxford and a JD from Harvard Law. Her career has included positions on the faculty of the University of Chicago Law School, Harvard Law School, and the Kennedy School. She has been dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. She has written or co-written four books, including The Idea That Is America, Keeping Faith With Our Values in a Dangerous World. She is on the advisory board of a host of nonprofit organizations, ranging from the Council on Foreign Relations to the National Endowment for democracy. She speaks widely, appears frequently on television and through the pages of the nation's most important newspapers, and Foreign Policy Magazine has named her to their annual list of top 100 global thinkers for the past three years. I could go on, but you get the idea. Actually, perhaps you don't. What I have described are professional achievements and titles, recognition and glory. There have been a number of honorary degrees and other prizes in there as well. What is most important about Anne-Marie Slaughter is what she has done with those titles and opportunities. She is a thinker, she is a reflector, and she acts. For instance, it states she was chief architect of the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, which provided a blueprint for using development as a pillar of American foreign policy and leading through civilian rather than military power. She received the Secretary's Distinguished Service Award for Exceptional Leadership and Professional Competence, the highest honor conferred by the State Department. But the reason I wanted Anne-Marie Slaughter to deliver this year's Salat Lecture on Freedom of the Press is because of another of her crusading interests. She has emerged as one of the most powerful voices raising alarm at the information war now quietly and not so quietly raging around the world. On one side, Anne-Marie's side, 
are governments that regard the free flow of information and the ability to access it to be a matter of fundamental human rights. On the other side, on China's side and Russia's side, for instance, it is the view that official control of information is a fundamental element of sovereign, which is to say government power. This divide has been termed the new Cold War, and the guerrilla fighters on the free flow side are the upstart new media and social media vanguard that are deigning to express their views, challenge authority, and hold governments accountable. Among the unlikely tools for waging this digital combat are a device first created as a way to meet girls at Harvard, also known as Facebook, and a mechanism with a silly name devised to make possible cryptic chats with friends, also known as Twitter. Anne-Marie has described Twitter as utterly essential. She uses it to learn, and she uses it to disseminate, and most important, she thinks about what it is and what it means, and how it can be used for democracy and how much danger it is in. She thinks about freedom of speech in the press as facilitated by new media and how that freedom or lack of it is apt to affect the world. It is freedom of the press 21st century style that she is here to speak about. The title of her lecture is Open Versus Closed, Media, Government, and Social Organization in the Information Age. Our salant lecturer, Anne-Marie Slaughter. Thank you. That was truly lovely. It's great to be back. Uh, I see many, many friends uh, in the audience, and uh, I have a, a tremendous affection uh, for the Kennedy School, for Cambridge, for, for being back. I was emailing my husband uh, to say only that it feels odd to be back here uh, without him, as we lived here for almost 20 years. We met here. We had both our children here, uh, and uh, it, it is very nice. I also want to say hello uh, to everybody who's out there on the web and everybody on Twitter. This has to have been the best organized, uh, best advertised uh, talk, at least according to my Twitter feed, that I think I've ever seen. So let me set the scene. In August, of 2011, about two months before the President's speech at the UN General Assembly, uh, the White House convened a meeting, and I won't divulge any confidentiality, but essentially a group of people sat there talking about uh, what to highlight uh, in the President's speech. And this is still the dog days of summer, where there's some certain amount of brainstorming uh, going on, and one of the participants said, you know, the real divide between governments in the 21st century is not between democracies and non-democracies. It's between open versus closed. Open governments versus closed governments. That's the axis of difference. Now, that has a lot to do with democracies versus non-democracies, but it is much less judgmental, at least in the context of American foreign policy, and it is not exactly the same. Out of that meeting uh, grew, the, that was the seed that bore fruit in the President's speech in, at the UN General Assembly in September uh, of tw uh, 2011. Uh, at that speech, he launched the Open Government Partnership, which started with eight nations. Uh, they were uh, the US, uh, Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, Norway, the U United Kingdom, the Philippines, and South Africa. So eight nations. Uh, two years later, it's ad th that partnership uh, has added 47 additional participants, and indeed, uh, most of the most active nations have not been the United States. It's been Brazil and South Africa, the United Kingdom. Uh, so we have 55 uh, nations who are participating. Participants sign the Open Government Partnership Charter. There's a set of principles which I'm going to talk about. Uh, they sign that uh, charter. They pledge publicly uh, to a set of actions to fulfill those principles around open government. So what I want to do this evening is to explore that basic idea 
that the axis of difference is now open versus closed. And I want to talk about what open versus closed means with respect to governments, and I will talk more about the open government partnership with respect to media uh, and with respect to social organization more broadly. Uh, I should say that I think in many ways uh, this dichotomy uh, is one that we are revisiting in many different settings, and these are very much uh, thoughts to open a conversation. There are things that, these are things I've been thinking about a great deal. I've been drawing on the work of others, but I fully uh, expect uh, something this major to be fleshed out with lots of different voices. Indeed, that's part of what open means. So I guess the first thing to say is if I say open versus closed, and I'm here in the Kennedy School and the Shorenstein Center giving the Salant Lecture, most people are going to say, well, open. If, you, if I give you a choice, open is better than closed. Uh, open is good. Open means making information available uh, for the press to access, to digest, to analyze, to critique, to disseminate. Uh, open means access. It means freedom of information. Uh, that's the foundation of an educated democracy, the source of the press's ability to be a check uh, on a democratically elected government or on any government. It has to have access to information. Things have to be open. But what about protection of sources? Then suddenly open's not so good. We, we like closed uh, when we think about that. Think about key national security secrets. Here last year in the Shorenstein Center, I heard Clay Shirky give a wonderful talk about how national security is still deeply nationalized. The U.S. government can go to the New York Times and the Washington Post and ask them to hold a story. They won't always, but they often will, if it's a matter of our national security. Then suddenly we want close. His point was the U.S. government cannot go to the Guardian or the London Times, so it's still very, very national. But it's very much a place where you still want things uh, to be closed. Um, any situation like that where we might be putting individuals at risk, we again want, we don't want to be disseminating that information. We want it to be closed. So this, just to start with, I want to problematize what open versus closed means, and I'm going to suggest, when, in talking about government and media and social organization, that we shouldn't be too quick to rush to open, that actually in this a process of far greater openness than ever before, a large part of what we have to do is to re rediscover the value of closed and figure out when we need it and how to protect it. But so let's go back to the open government partnership, open governments versus closed governments. So what do we mean by open government? Well, the first thing in this charter of principles we mean is transparent government. So if you look at the, the statement of principles, they talk about increasing the availability of information about governmental activities, making it what government does open to as many people as possible. Uh, it means uh, giving citizens a right to seek information, FOIA, right, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, gov other governments are committing uh, to do that. Uh, it means promoting access to information. So it isn't just you put the law on the books, you actually make it easy for people to do, and you tell them they have that uh, right to do that. Uh, and you commit to doing that at every level of government. It means increasing government's efforts systematically to collect data, right? Government can say, we'll make all the information we have available and then not collect data on what it does. This actually requires government to collect data on what it does systematically and to publish it, and it means to publish it, and this is very important, in usable form. Right? You could do a huge data dump on you know, every uh, grant that a government agency gave, uh, and you can do it in a way that it's there, but nobody can actually use it. So a commitment to transparency means publishing it and publishing it uh, in usable form. Uh, it means uh, that even further than that, it says a form that the public can locate, understand, and use, and in interoperable format. So you can compare what one government's doing uh, to another government. Uh, it actually commits further to providing access to effective remedies if people have been de denied information, uh, and recognizing the importance of open standards so that when government puts out data, 
and it makes it usable, it uses a standard that others can use so again you can aggregate information and compare it. Uh, so it's, it's much more than just sort of pulling back the curtain on what government does. It is a commitment uh, to transparency that is a commitment to make information visible but also usable. So that's the first point about open government. You're actually making information visible but usable in a way that invites a conversation. And indeed, the second principle of open government is participatory. So open means visible, it means participatory, and participatory means these governments are pledging to support civic participation, valuing the public participation of all people equally without discrimination, public engagement, uh, including the full participation of women, that's actually in the charter, the open government uh, charter, uh, it means to make, e it's a commitment to make policy formulation and decision making more transparent, something that everybody in this room who's been in government would appreciate even in government, uh, since the, where the decision is actually being made is not always transparent. Um, it means deepening public participation in actually uh, developing, monitoring, and evaluating government activities. So you've got to make it easy for your critics to get at you effectively. You have to, to make it easy for them to access, but not just to access, but to critique, respond, uh, and come back at you. So this part of the commitment, the, to, that, that, it, that it means a commitment to transparency, which means usability, but to, particip to participation, it isn't just saying we're going to allow citizens to participate. It says we're going to create a process that is going to make it easy for them to participate, easy for them to engage in a conversation uh, with us, and we're going to enable them to act on that information. So we're going to enable them to hold us uh, to account. That also uh, means fundamentally that the commitment to being a participatory government is a commitment to being a responsive uh, government. And if you're going to be a responsive government, then you actually have to be even more, you have to be persuadable. If you're saying to your citizens, we want you to participate, and you're giving them the process by which to participate, but if once they participate, you simply say, that's nice, it's like comments on a blog, if I get those comments, but I don't respond to those comments, that's not actually meaningful participation. That is. Uh, formal participation, but not substantive participation. So if a government says, I believe in, in, I'm committing to a participatory citizenry, it's saying, I'm going to respond. And if I respond, I have to be willing to change my mind, because otherwise I'm not really engaging uh, in, in any kind of meaningful conversation. And the third and last uh, major principle that open government uh, means is accountability. Uh, but here again, it's interesting, accountability in the open government partnership actually means integrity. It actually means honesty. You might think, as I expected, that it would mean you can hold us to account, but what it means is implement the highest standards of professional integrity. Uh, it means having robust anti-corruption policies, uh, transparency in the manage of pub management of public finances. It means making a, having a legal framework uh, that you, where you make transparent the income and assets of all high government uh, officials, uh, and it means actually putting in place a whole set of deterrents against bribery. So that's kind of interesting. You might not have thought that open government met a commitment to honesty and integrity in your government officials. At least, it, it's not the first thing I think you'd think about if you thought about uh, open government. Uh, so in that sense, the way I think about it is they're committing to no secret channels of influence. In other words, they're committing to you have influence through the established channels that we've just told you about and enabled you to use. You do not have influence through money, through connections, through private uh, channels. Um, so the, it is a, it's accountability in the sense that everybody has an equal chance uh, to hold uh, government to account. I have to say when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about our own government and how we fare on that particular measure uh, of no secret channels of influence. Uh, every fundraiser I've been asked to attend this fall has been in the order of twenty to thirty thousand dollars to even shake the hand of a, ca of a candidate. 
uh, given Citizens United. I don't think we fare very well on open government if open government means uh, the highest standards of professional integrity and established channels of influence. Indeed, Larry Lessig here uh, at Harvard uh, has this wonderful project on institutionalized corruption. This is not individuals taking bribes. It's money washing through the system as a whole, but it means secret channels of influence that are not uh, equally distributed. So given that the United States signed the Open Government Partnership, uh, we have work to, work to do. The last thing to say about uh, what open versus closed means in government is, interestingly, a commitment to technology. And here, I think we shouldn't think of technology just as information technology or communication technology, electronic technology. Technology is whatever it takes to actually implement uh, these pledges. But actually, there's a commitment to continually upgrade the technology that enables citizens to participate, to have access to information, uh, and to uh, insist on standards of integrity. So if, just to summarize uh, this first part, what does open versus closed mean if we're thinking about uh, government? Well, open means transparent. Uh, and beyond transparent, it means providing usable information. Uh, it means participatory, and participatory in the sense of actually enabling your citizens to engage with you equally. Uh, and it means uh, honest uh, in the sense that you have no secret channels of influence, and you allow your citizens uh, to visibly see uh, what, what their officials are being, uh, being uh, paid. So then what is closed? How do we think about we, all these governments? They've all signed on to the Open Government Partnership. They're all committing. They all have action plans as to how they are going to improve their behavior on one or more of these dimensions. Well, closed means secret. It means small uh, and a non-expandable number of decision makers. It means being non-responsive to summary. It means officials who are non-answerable for wrongdoing, all things we don't like, which is why we champion the Open Government Partnership. And on that uh, by that standard, if you apply it, you actually get a different measure than democracy and non-democracy. If you think what I said uh, was, uh, you, if it's secret, if it, there's a non-expandable number of decision makers, non-responsive to the citizenry, think about China for a minute. China actually is responsive to its citizenry in all sorts of ways, certainly not evenly, certainly not uh, in ways that we champion, but it's not fair to say it's non-responsive. When there are protests, there are responses. When I have talked to mayors in Shanghai, and of course a mayor of a district in Shanghai is a mayor of two million people, uh, one district in Shanghai, they talk about protests if they want to put a rail line through or they want to condemn uh, some particular property. So there is a sense of responding to citizen, uh, citizen protests, citizen engagement. If you apply these labels, you will get different uh, uh, measures of governments that we are accustomed to categorizing in one way or another. Doesn't mean they don't need change, but it, it's a, it, it is a different measure. But just to, to end on, in terms of thinking about closed for a minute. I just told you all the bad things that closed is. But then, if we think about government, and we think about government decision making, if you can't keep secrets, at least some secrets, you can't get anything done. You cannot make any decisions. Try sharing a government commission that is subject to the full Transparent Procedure Act, nothing ever gets discussed or decided because no one will actually talk in a way that allows you to, to make some kinds of progress. If you have too many uh, formal decision makers, if it's the sort of steadily expanding number of decision makers, well then secret channels, back channels will immediately open up. If too many people are in the room, then people simply make decisions outside the room and you're right back uh, to where you started. Uh, and finally, if it's too participatory, in some ways if you make all this information available and you enable everyone to use it, what will happen? I'm teaching politics of public policy this fall and we're teaching the very basics of pol politics anywhere, certainly Americans' politics. Small concentrated groups have far more incentive to track down that information and use it relentlessly. 
That is not necessarily representative. That is participatory, but it is not equally participatory. And you are empowering some groups to have far more influence than others. I'm not arguing for closed government. It doesn't have nearly the same uh, attractive ring. But I am suggesting that if you, if you put down all those different definitions of what open government means, we're going to have to reclaim some of that space for closed decision making, for secrecy, uh, for limited uh, participation. So let me talk now about media. Uh, again, sort of thinking about what does open versus closed mean in media. And start with a spectrum. Think about open and closed. And on the uh, closed, well, actually, closed versus open. Um, and I won't do the left right thing. I'm just saying. <laughs> but uh, closed. So on one end of the spectrum, uh, you would maybe start uh, with the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Or, I'm sorry, with the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times. Why? Why do I put them over here on closed? Well, they're still behind a paywall. I just try linking to an article uh, on either one. You will get howls of protest uh, from people on Twitter uh, saying, I can't access that, that paper because it's behind a paywall. I don't pay. I don't subscribe. So in, in, in that sense, you'd put them there. Uh, you would put uh, the New York Times uh, in the center. You can get today's paper, but there's lots of stuff you can't get unless you actually subscribe. Uh, and then you would put... Uh, something like uh, the, the um, you know, HuffPost or any of the completely free and open uh, news sources uh, over all the way over on open. So that's one way uh, of thinking about closed versus open, just reader access. How open are you to reader access? Do you have to pay? Do you have to pay for some of it? Or is it all open to you? But then think about another spectrum. Now think about the, not how news is consumed, but how news is produced. And here, I put the New York Times over on closed. You have to be asked to produce news for the New York Times. The New York Times does not just take my sense of what is important in a given day. And every single person in this room, and no matter how powerful, is at the mercy of the New York Times op-ed editor. And all of us uh, have had the experience of begging the op-ed editor with some dignity, one hopes, but uh, to take your incredibly valuable opinion. So it's closed. It is, it is, you have to be hired, you're paid, you have to be given the New York Times imprimatur to actually put out news on behalf of the New York Times. HuffPost is somewhere in the middle where actually anybody can post on HuffPost, but the stories that get the most attention, every now and then somebody gets lucky, writes something and lots and lots of other people see it and it goes to the front, but most of the stories are commissioned uh, and either paid for or at least uh, hired uh, in the middle. Uh, similarly, you, you could say, um, so that's, that's sort of a, it's sort of a mixed bag. Then go over to something like CNN I reports, or even better, CNN I reports, anybody can send in. There's still selection as to what they show, but anybody can send it in. Or go to something like Al Jazeera Stream. So Al Jazeera Stream uh, is actually, it defines itself as a social media community with its own a, uh, daily TV show on Al Jazeera. So, and if you go on the site, social media, media community with its own TV show, you'll see a map. And on the map, there are lots of little flags that show you where videos have been produced. And it says, um, record your own video here. And there's a link where if you click it, I have never recorded a video, but I'm, I would believe if you click it, you can record your video. Um, and it says, record your own video, uh, and then we will show it uh, on, on the TV show. So this is now, uh, it, this is complete open in terms of produ production. Although I have to believe, again, there is some actual editing and selection as to what goes into the TV show, but the invitation is completely open. And Al Jazeera English as a whole, as a whole, not just a Al Jazeera stream, but the entire site defines itself as a community. And it has rules of the community. If you look down, it says, you know, these are the rules. We value thoughtful, constructive discussion. Uh, we don't uh, want comments that smear an, uh, an organization or attack an author. Um, we want these kinds of uh, participation. We want information or clarifications on breaking news stories. If they're complaints, here's where you send them and a bunch of other rules. 
So it's kind of interesting. I don't think the New York Times defines itself as a community. It defines itself as something that puts out the news, that broadcasts uh, the news. But that's moving, as you move to open, discussion, participation, becomes an increasing part of the very uh, identity. And at the very far end of the spectrum, there is whatever any one of us want to create as a newspaper. You can, there's an app that will allow you to take all the stories that you have collected on Twitter that day, and they will then be put into the format of a newspaper front page. Right? So it's all nicely spaced, it's got all the capitals, uh, and it says, and you see this on Twitter all the time, the Brussels Embassy Daily News. And it will say, with stories via Slaughter AM, if they got one of my stories, uh, and they thought that that was, it, I didn't write the story, I just chose the story. They assembled the story and they put it out. So now you're getting to the point where you have exactly uh, people who, the, the news is out there being collected by everyone, or generated by everyone, and then produced by anyone. It is completely open with respect to consumers and producers. And indeed, Twitter more generally, Alex said I spend a lot of time on it, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about it because it has allowed me to customize my own daily newspaper. That's what I do. I now get articles from lots of wonderful reporters. They write for the New York Times, but they write for the Financial Times, they write for the Guardian, they write for newspapers in Pakistan and India and China. You follow them, you customize your daily paper. And of course you don't just follow reporters, you follow people on the ground. You are then the consumer who is customizing your own product. All right, so if that's our spectrum, we had open versus closed in terms of reader access, but then we had open versus closed in terms of who produces the news. And you have the New York Times all the way to any Twitter user's decision to put out their daily news. So let's just reflect on that for a minute, open versus closed in media. The first thing that, that jumps out is open is not synonymous with free. This is a lecture on freedom of the press, but when we talk about a free press, we are thinking about the producer is free to publish whatever it wants, right? And so readers are able to get whatever it wants to put out. There's no censorship. It is free to publish what it wants. We are not talking about the freedom of anyone to be a newspaper. I mean, in some sense we are, in the, in the sense that government censorship could say, no, only certain people can publish a newspaper. Well, we're not generally thinking of the citizenry as a whole participating in the production uh, of the news. It also means that open can mean very low quality seriously low quality. Spend a couple hours on Twitter, go back to your favorite newspaper site, and you will want to hug the reporters and editors that produce this fine product. The sophistication, the editing, the quality of the writing, the actual logic of what is produced. Uh, so in that sense, I, I love Twitter, but you know, there are a lot of very bad newspapers out there, and the fact that you can put out a story does not make you a reporter. So open can mean very uh, low quality. And finally, open sense really means no more media. I and mean, in what I just described, where I take all the stories that I have found interesting and I make a newspaper out of them and I send that out to however many, many people want to read it, and people do, there's no intermediary. There's just the people and the people putting out, I mean, you could say I'm an intermediary, but I'm a consumer and a producer simultaneously. So if you really go all the way to open, you've lost the media in the sense of the intermediary that channels uh, what we say, that selects, uh, and that broadcasts uh, back out. Um, so from that perspective too, close starts looking pretty good. Uh, I'm going to make a case, uh, there's a lot of reason to have a relatively closed shop in producing the news, and what you're increasingly seeing is organizations falling somewhere in between. And here I want to uh, suggest that the future of a lot of traditionally closed media, and obviously they're looking for a business model, and if I had one, I don't think I'd be just giving this lecture. I, I would be uh, counseling many major uh, newspapers. But the, one of the in-betweens is curation. 
I was just invited to the Museum of Modern Art seminar on curation, which I thought was particularly interesting. Obviously, they're a museum, so they know about curation, but that's not what they were talking about. They were talking about curation of news, curation, curation of ideas, curation uh, of thoughts. Uh, give you an example, uh, and if you haven't been on it, I recommend there is a woman in Brooklyn um, who runs a site called Brain Pickings. Uh, brain, brain Pickings is de described uh, as a human-powered discovery engine for interestingness, culling and curating cross-disciplinary curiosity quenchers, and separating the signal from the noise to bring you things you didn't know you were interested in until you are. She is fabulous. The things she sends out once every week, you get a newsletter on Sunday mornings when you have some time, amazingly interesting, diverse, fabulous ideas, stories, uh, and, and uh, uh, reviews of various kinds. That idea of curating, where you, you are reaching from a much, much broader pool, but somebody's individual sensibility, like the reporter and the editor traditionally, is deciding of that news you should see. It links to the individual people, so they're not mushed in, they're not like sources, they are still independent. But it's a bringing together that is a midway point between here are the stories you must read and you're on your own in the wilderness of information. Final note before talking about uh, social organization. There's an interesting link uh, between uh, the um, ways in which uh, open government and open media intersect. And Alec uh, referred to it uh, in, his, in his introduction, where he talked about a cold war uh, between broadcast media outlets and social media. The phrase is not mine. I would have liked it to be, but I still believe in uh, certainly uh, giving credit. Uh, and that Philip Howard uh, is, interestingly enough, a professor of communication, information, and international studies, something that we didn't used to have, a professor of, professor of communication, information, and international studies. He's at the University of Washington. And he describes the ways in which broadcast media and social media assume very different organizational models. Broadcast media requires funding and thus it can be much more easily controlled, which is to say closed governments favor broadcast media. O uh, social media, of course, does not require funding. All it requires, it does require access to the internet, but it essentially uh, requires only uh, an account, uh, and it is, it is not susceptible to state control. You can, you can control it, but only often by bringing down the entire internet or doing things that otherwise will really anger many of your citizens in ways uh, that you don't want to. Uh, so he, he has looked at the media culture of countries as, uh, like Russia, Syria, and Saudi Arabia uh, and concludes uh, even though each of those countries has a very different media culture, one thing that the closed governments like broadcast media, open governments far more comfortable with social media. All right, last question. So what does open versus closed mean for social organization? Now, that's a big question to ask at the end of my lecture, and I could give a whole lecture just defining social organization, and I will not, uh, I promise. Um, but again, the answer's not as obvious as you might think initially. So start with just the definition of open versus closed systems. And this is something we actually thought about quite a lot uh, in the government, uh, in the, the premise that we are now, we the country, are in an open international system. So what's the difference? A closed system has no, ex no external shocks. It is closed to outside. It is totally within the boundaries of the system. It can thus be predicted. It can be commanded. It can be controlled. An open system is a system open to outside shocks, outside events, outside stimuli. It cannot be predicted because you never know when one of those things is going to disrupt what's within the system, and it cannot be controlled. It can be influenced, and we thought a lot about if you think the United States is operating in a world that's an open system, it means command and control doesn't work. It never did, really, but at least there was the illusion of it. Uh, Credible influence is the best way to go. So you can think about that. That makes a lot of sense if we think about you know, open versus closed 
uh, countries. We think North Korea is closed. The United States uh, is open. Luxembourg is the most open, right? It means whatever, the smaller the country, the more the boundaries, the more uh, susceptible you are to outside uh, shocks. Or think about Karl Popper's definition of open society, right? Right, actually building on the, the work of Henry Bergson, and I'll just say right now, I'm not going to answer questions on Karl Popper. It's been a long time uh, since I uh, worked my way through the original text. Um, but essentially there the idea was an open society, was a society that you could, where you could change the government without bloodshed. Where you could, the government, there were ways of turning the government open, and a closed society was one where the only way to change the government was through violence, uh, through a coup or revolution. And he also talked about open society in terms of individual choice. An open society is one where an individual has a range of choices rather than being part of some group. Could be a family, could be a tribe, could be an ideology, a party, uh, but where your decisions uh, are made for you. And if you look now at the Open Society Foundations, of course, uh, George Soros's foundations directly influenced uh, by the work of Karl Popper, you would not be surprised at the values of, of open society. It's human rights, dignity, and rule of law. It's the, the um, holding those in power accountable, empowering people and communities to make change themselves. But it's also the freedom of all people again, like open government, to participate equally in civic, economic, and cultural life. So it's not just that people have choices, it's that their choices have to be allowed to influence what happens in the government. They have to be able to equally participate uh, in civic, economic, and cultural life. There again, the difference between an open society and a liberal democracy. Why use the term open society as we use the term open government? You could debate this for a long time, the, the precise distinctions between what we mean by democracy, what we mean by open society, but I want to again suggest that open here captures a quality of direct interaction, of engagement, uh, of conversation uh, between the government uh, and its citizens. Uh, that citizens don't just elect their government, they continue actively engaging with it in a continual responsive learning cycle. That, I think, is, again, a more useful way of thinking about societies and governments than labeling them uh, any kind of crusty, whether it's democracy, autocracy, plutocracy, or anything uh, in between. I want to close by looking to one final definition of open. And this one comes uh, from the leader of the social justice movement in Israel, a 26-year-old woman named Stav Shafir, who gave a riveting uh, talk at the Personal Democracy Forum in June. You can find it on the Personal Democracy Forum website. Uh, and she talked about the open source movement. And at the Personal Democracy Forum, there's a lot about the open source movement. The ability, if you think of Linux versus Microsoft, open code, anybody can uh, add on to it, improve it. Uh, it is the, the power uh, of the collective because it is open. And she talked about how you apply those principles to a protest. And she said, there's three basic ideas. One is that you start small and simple. You start very small. You talk about a housing protest. You don't talk about a process against social injustice. You start small and let it grow. You trust people to be smart and to create. So you do your housing protest, but if somebody wants to do a related protest over the, high, the cost of rent in the next street over, that's fine. You let them do that. You let people contribute in their own way. Mind you, these protests had 300,000 people on the streets of Tel Aviv. It was a very large deal. It was the equivalent of Occupy Wall Street uh, in Israel. And finally, she says, no logos or identifying marks, no t-shirts, no buttons. She said, it is uh, very important for the protest to seem like an organic development and not an organized rebellion. Now note that's exactly the criticism of Occupy Wall Street, right? That they were not organized, that they were not a movement. She says this is a deliberate effort to be organic, to let people come together to be spontaneous and creative. Look, that had all sorts of problems when it came to a town meeting, as we saw those meetings in Zuccotti Park, but it worked to assemble 
resemble a protest and to get people to mimic that protest across the country, which happened here and did change the national conversation. We'd be having a different election rhetoric if we had not had uh, Occupy Wall Street. I want to, but what interests me the most is that for her and for Occupy Wall Street, for the open source movement, open means equal. It means equal. They did everything they could to make sure there is no hierarchy, that everybody's on the same footing, that everybody can contribute in their own way, that nobody's even identified. And she talked about when politicians wanted to come talk to them, they couldn't address them. They had to be part of the, of the group. You know, that kind of organization works a lot better online uh, than in a meeting, because online you can take your own time, it's asynchronous, you can take your bit of code and work on it and put it back and everybody doesn't have to sit there and watch you, but if it were a meeting like this and it were all open, everybody would get up and everybody would have their say and we'd have to listen to them. So it is a form of organization that definitely works better in some contexts uh, than others, but it is a notion of open that means leveling, that means flat, uh, that means uh, sort of a vast plane where nobody can raise themselves above others uh, nobody, and everyone has an equal right uh, to participate. Now, I actually think, of course, everything that is open needs some part that is closed. Every network needs some hierarchy and every hierarchy needs some network. There is not one or the other end of the spectrum. But I do want to say that if open means equal, then unequal means closed. And if unequal means closed, then the United States is becoming more and more a closed society. That what we write about in terms of economic inequality actually means being politically closed. It means moving on that spectrum closer to those countries that we are asking to pledge to be more open. Because when you try to make a society more open, the first thing you do, and throughout all my examples tonight, you make people more equal, more able to participate. When people are as unequal as this society is now, they cannot participate in their government, and we are increasingly a closed society. However, we have the press and we do have a free press, and it is a free press that can point that out relentlessly, day after day, and hold us to our own professed values, whether they be of democracy or open government or any other principles you choose to use. It is a free press, may it stay a free press. I could not be more honored to have delivered the Richard Salant Lecture on Freedom of the Press. Thank you. Smart, reflective, thoughtful, I think we would all agree. Uh, Anne-Marie has agreed to, uh, to answer some questions. There are microphones here, 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 and over here. Um, the rules are make it a question, make it short with one thought, and, uh, and make it as brief as you can. Uh, Alex? Hi, thank you very much for coming. My name is Alex Remington. I'm a second year MPP. I wanted to ask you, I know that you spoke tonight really about the choices that are made at a state level, um, but I wanted to ask about the implications of those choices and some possible solutions for questions of privacy and cy cybersecurity. Many of the tools that you've mentioned, including open source, and the, the leveling and equality that comes from openness place uh, an increased amount of power in the hands of non-state actors. So what can states do on a policy level to account for the fact that whether they choose open or closed, it's not ultimately entirely up to them? Mm. Well, do you have time for a whole other lecture? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it, it is, um, it's, it's a great question, and it is, again, it's exactly an area where closed starts looking better as governments realize they really can't control their, their environment uh, and indeed, even at the level of teaching an ambassador to use Twitter, you have to say, you know, you can't control it. You, ju you can't control it. You just jump in and sort of let it go. Um, 
So some of my answer is you just have to kind of let go the illusion of control and work in ways that, uh, that accept uh, a certain amount of indeterminacy and uncertainty and constant change, which is exactly what corporations are learning to do. Uh, but in other ways, that's why I emphasize we, we do have to find some much higher protections. I mean, Joe Nye sitting in the front row has done a lot of work on cybersecurity. That is absolutely critical. I mean, we, we do need to find ways where we can protect uh, and where, where there are, even in an open internet that I'm completely for, that there are ways to put up some walls to protect both people and, and governments uh, and, and organizations in various ways. That's, that's a whole agenda, and I, I don't have the answers, but I do think that's exactly where we now have to head as much as we want open. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for your remarks. So with open media... You identify yourself. Sorry, I'm Elsa, I'm a student at the college. So with open media and social media and the ability to self-curate, also comes the ability to select to hear from opinions that confirm our own beliefs or that mm -hmm. agree with us. And I think that that has really contributed to polarization in politics today. And I was hoping you could talk about ways of overcoming that. So we are living in different media universes as a, as a country. Mm. You know, it, it is such an important question. I always have a hard time believing this because I actually find that social media exposes you to far more difference than you're accustomed to. I frequently say that, you know, once you've become a dean in your day job, few people tell you you really don't, aren't making sense or that was really stupid or you, that was dead wrong. And David's saying, no, actually here at the Kennedy School, I guess so, but, uh, but you know, nobody hesitates to tell me that on Twitter, uh, loudly, clearly, uh, and I actually find that I engage with a wide range of people I wouldn't. It has become apparent to me, and I know the research, that in part, that's, that's because as academics, we welcome that kind of debate. That's actually what we're trained to do. Most people do not, and I accept uh, the idea that, that it does lead to a certain uh, self-reinforcement. You know, I think in some ways, this isn't something can be solved uh, in cyberspace. I think the deeper problem is actually at the community level, the idea that you don't have to associate with anybody that you don't want to and that you can't legislate it uh, in, in cyberspace. I do think we can do a much better job of, and again, I would start at the local level, I'd start at schools, of encouraging, of, of really in, in, inculcating the idea that it's through debate with those who disagree with you that you actually grow. And I'll, I'll just give you a very silly example. When we were watching uh, the Democratic the debate last week, my son was on Facebook during the whole debate debating with the president of the Republican Club uh, as the debate unfolded, uh, asking us for ammunition, I have to say. Uh, but, <laughs> but my point is, for him, that was both a fun activity and something where he thought he benefited. And I actually think we have to start at that level not by regulating cyberspace. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Liara Falk. I'm a second year MPP student and a journalist. Um, my question is about traditional media. In an open society or moving towards an open society, does traditional media have a responsibility in terms of either the content um, that they publish? So the New York Times, for example, has been criticized for publishing trend stories about uh, tree houses that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, trend stories for the very rich, or in terms of, uh, so responsibility in terms of content or in terms of orientation, is there a role for traditional media in encouraging civic participation and this um, engagement with the government that you were talking about? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I do think so in the sense that, that's why, uh, the, the, to the extent even traditional media starts thinking of itself as a community, as opposed to a product that you put out and people read. In general, I mean, I wouldn't say everybody, but in general, they value a diversity of voices in the community. If you think about it, it's my product, then you decide this is what I'm gonna produce. But if you think about it as a conversation, 
If you are a newspaper, you know, you don't want to be just speaking to the people that you talk to. Every panel, every conference, you try to get some kind of, of diversity. So to the extent the New York Times and other traditional newspapers start thinking of at least part of what they do as the cultivation of different conversational communities, expert communities, one example I didn't give is the things like the Atlantic increasingly creating channels, right? They're creating ch information channels. Those channels are then creating what you'd call a community of like-minded people, a community of practice. Uh, and there, I think, actually, there is a role then for bringing people into dialogue. And if government is alive to that, actually uh, creating more participation. Hi, I'm Auden Lawrence. I'm a freshman at the college. And I would like to um, ask you the following question on behalf of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Um, so has the media contributed positively to the dialogue about democracy movements throughout the world? Or has there, like the Arab Spring, or has there been any sort of media bias that may have helped to counteract conflict resolution? Ooh, um, well, I definitely think social media has played a positive role uh, in the Arab revolutions. Uh, I don't think it's the causal role, but it was, it was a facilitating role that was very important uh, in, in, in various key moments. And the best way uh, that I heard this put was an Egyptian blogger who said, before social media, by the time you got a factory organized or a university organized, the government was already there. You couldn't move fast enough to stay ahead of them. And the speed of social media uh, changed that. So there, I think, without question, uh, I also think, again, the fact that Facebook or Twitter allows you to create smaller clubs of like-minded people is very important for, for giving you courage, right? If you know your friends are out there with you, a whole lot easier than going out on your own. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at Syria right now, and I've written this, that, that you know, imagine if the United Nations had a website where anybody could upload videos and they'd be verified. Uh, and they sort of are by curators on Twitter, but where you have, you have somebody who knows different Syrian accents, uh, who, somebody who can tell, was this footage shot before? Somebody who can say, yes, this is the right date. If you had a verified source of alternate information, dynamics within Syria could be very different because obviously the control of the, the satellite media is very important for the Syrian government. And I don't think we thought nearly enough how to use information uh, that is uh, professionally curated and verified as a tool uh, in, in preventing conflict or resolving conflict. Yes. Thank you. Ricardo Trotti, I'm a fellow at the uh, Weatherhead Center. Uh, Hugo Chavez, I want to take you to the international arena now. Hugo Chavez won the election last Sunday and he will govern at least for 20 years. The Castro's brothers surpassed 50 years in, pa in power. Both governments are close and getting worse in the case of Venezuela right now. Since John Kennedy government, the U.S. tried different methodology on information, somebody will call it propaganda in, in Latin America, through UCs, USAID, NED, to open those societies, but I believe we were not successful, perhaps because those governments foresee those programs as propaganda mm -hmm. and interference. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a better way that the U.S. can implement communication and freedom of the press programs to open those governments and others around the world? Uh, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I do. I mean, to begin with, I think both cell phones are much more valuable in Cuba than any amount of beaming in uh, uh, government um, information. And in general, I think creating channels so that the citizens of those populations can see not what our government thinks they should see, not even, even though I am on the board of the NED, but not even something that what an organization does, but just the diversity of our own conversation. I mean, even in our, uh, in Radio Liberty or, or our various uh, um, but, uh, channels, we get the highest ratings when we critique ourselves. After a Watergate, after a scandal, we get much higher ratings when suddenly other people see us not telling them how great we are, but actually criticizing our own government and holding it to account. So the first thing I would say is it's much more important to create people-to-people -people channels to the extent you can. But the second thing I would say is for some governments, 
it's just a function of time. I mean, the demographics do ultimately make a difference. We knew that there was going to be upheaval in the Arab world. We just didn't know exactly when, but there were plenty of memos that said, you've got 70% of the population under 30 and they're unemployed. This is not going to last. And ultimately, old leaders do die. Uh, so there, it, I think there is much better we can do. I'm not convinced that there's anything we could actually do at this point that would overturn the Castros uh, any faster than they will otherwise be overturned. And yes, Chavez won, but I still think the signs are looking better in Venezuela than they've looked in a long time. Two more questions here and then over here. Hello, my name is Ava Rogers. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm also a career foreign service officer. Um, but my question actually pertains to the domestic context. Um, at the state and local government here in the United States, what are ways and ideas that you have for strengthening the link between participation and actual influence? Participation in government, in the federal government. Participation in terms of using the open, open government system, but having that translate into actual influence in terms of decisions and policies. Ah. Um. But as you probably know, uh, Secretary Clinton created an Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. And when I first heard that, I thought, I thought we were the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. I mean, what else are we doing? And what she was doing was outreach to mayors, outreach to governors uh, in ways that could both get ideas from them but integrate them into a much broader foreign policy, a concept of foreign policy, so that you know there are lots of sister cities already, but there, there are actually many more ways in which networks of cities, groups of governors, I think, can make a, a big difference. Uh, some, a lot of that, I mean, some of that has to change at the local level, and it's really about giving them the channels of access. Uh, she created an office. There's far more, I think, that you could do. I actually think getting individual embassies to be able to connect the, the countries that they're in to different cities, to different uh, um, uh, uh, states, uh, the Army's done this and with partnerships with the National Guard uh, would make a big difference. Uh, so a lot of it's creating channels, but the rest, of the rest of it is really education, right? Going to lots and lots of, you, we're not allowed to recruit domestically or to lobby domestically, but actually we need all of those actors as part of our foreign affairs arsenal, and there have got to be ways to spend more time within the country in a way that is not breaking the law, but does engage them, and I think we're just at the outset of that. I'm a student at the college, and it's been a privilege to listen to you Thank this you. evening. Um, doesn't confining the limiting terms of open and closed oversimplify <laughs> the reality of the, of the age of information and lend itself to hypocrisy in some sense? <laughs> what well, definitely simplifies. Um, I appreciate your question in the spirit of dialogue that I have welcomed. <laughs> Um, it, uh, absolutely, uh, it does, and I guess what I would say is I think it may be a better simplification than democracy or non-democracy. I think it is less judgmental, uh, but it may also invite more reflective scrutiny. Uh, and obviously wh where I ended was, you know, the United States created the Open Government Partnership, and that's great, and we've got all these other governments doing it, and that's wonderful. But if we really look at what it means, we're not nearly as open as we think we are. We're very convinced we're a democracy. I actually think we have an awful lot of reform to do there, too. Uh, but I'm suggesting it is an oversimplification that may be more useful. Thank you. Emory, you have uh, given us a salant lecture that I heard, and now I'm going to go back and read. <laughs> and I mean that as a great compliment. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all. And thank you, Anne-Marie. <laughs>